Welcome to DeFi by Design, where we talk all things blockchain and cryptocurrency, while striving to educate, empower, and enrich. What's up, guys? Just want to take a quick break and tell you about our sponsors for DeFi Slate. So first, we have Acropolis. Acropolis is an all-in-one DeFi yield farming platform. They actually offer dollar cost averaging into Bitcoin and Ethereum uncollateralized loans and their mainnet just launched it's called delphi and they actually just filled it up to a cap and they have governance launching soon check out acropolis.io for more and then we have mc dex mc dex is the first decentralized perpetual swap exchange they offer up to 10x on ethereum perpetual swaps and 5x on link as well as lend and snx completely decentralized trading on mc dex you can check them out on mcdex.io both these platforms are extremely active in the DeFi space and their protocols are growing and the users are as well. So check those out um, and we'll get right back to the podcast now. Welcome to DeFi by Design episode six. Today we are with Andre from the Opium team. Really excited for this one. They've been working on some really cool stuff, some partnerships with Aave, um, a bunch of derivatives, trading and exchanges. Really interesting stuff. Things have been heating up recently in DeFi, and we are here to break it all down for you guys and keep you guys on track. How are you doing today, Rob? Chilling, Andrew. Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to be here, too. Uh, Andre has actually enlightened, in my mind, all of the new possibilities for DeFi in the form of derivatives. So I'm excited to hear uh, everything that's going on at Opium and kind of across the board how derivatives can contribute to DeFi and just keep this train pushing. Yeah, for sure. Hello, guys. Yes, uh, thanks. Thanks for the nice intro. And indeed, it's a lot of possibilities, a lot of challenges, opportunities, and excitement about derivatives. But I'm coming from the real financial system, or should I should should they call it real centralized big financial system? And I was already excited for about ten years. So I'm happy happy to share it with you. Yeah. Awesome, awesome. So just so everybody understands what Opium is and kind of what you guys are trying to do here in the DeFi space, would you mind just a quick little rundown for those who aren't aware of Opium or who don't really understand how the derivatives work? Yep, sure. So the Opium is the protocol, but the Opium is also exchange on top of the protocol. And uh, to be short, it's a protocol which allows to build you any derivative in a decentralized, absolutely non-custodial, trustless way. And what is derivative? Derivative is an uh, instrument to share risk, to take risk, to uh, sell the risk, to trade the risk. And this is very generic definition. What it means, because people uh, don't necessarily think about derivatives on a daily basis, but everybody, I swear everybody in the world have exposure in derivatives. If you have a bank account, if you have mortgage, if you have a pension, it's all hedged by the derivatives and they are really uh, needed by the financial system. But also nowadays, much easier to trade derivatives and uh, even retail clients, even the normal people who not necessarily in financial world and just want to have certain exposure, they can easily trade derivatives nowadays. And with decentralized derivatives, it's even easier, it's more democratic and it has endless possibilities because it's also breaking all kinds of barriers. Right, right. So we're effectively taking a concept that has been made and has made its mark in the traditional world as here to stay and as in most economic markets and trying to basically bring it on chain in a decentralized fashion. So what does that kind of look like for you guys as a process in navigating that decentralized landscape? What are some of the things that you guys have done, you know, and, and, and through this navigation, as I like to see it as like a little wild, wild west kind of idea, you know, through this journey that you guys have started to embark on, you know, what have you guys pushed forward, you know, with these decentralized derivatives? Yes, we started a long time ago. Basically, I was trading derivatives for more than 10 years and I was managing very big funds. And we started three years ago, the Opium team. And the first idea was, okay, derivative market is, is huge, it's not super efficient in a, in a traditional finance, and we can change it. We can bring a lot of innovation there. So, and we built Opium, not for the DeFi, because now everybody uh, are talking about DeFi, but we built Opium before DeFi, and we built it as a solution for the financial system, for the global economy, basically. And we started to build it. We have seen uh, no oracles, not no good oracles back then, no stable coins. 
or maybe few very at the very beginning. And now we have DeFi, which is absolutely amazing. Now we have a lot of interest from banks and uh, Goldman Sachs just announced that it's priority number one for them. They put a new head of the digital strategy and so on, so on. So that's indeed a lot of excitement. And we, when we started, we just started to build a first option for the Ethereum versus US dollar or any stable coin. And once we started to build it, uh, we, we built it and it, it was cool. We, we decided that we want also to have futures because it's very similar to have futures. Once we built that, uh, we wanted a CDS and uh, some more sexy products. We understood that we are doing basically the same job again and again. And that's the moment where we decided to make an, a protocol. And the protocol is universal ecosystem that you can basically teach what is the option, what is the future, what is the CDS, and it will directly work with it in, in a very consistent professional ecosystem. So that's what we built. And at some point on, on the way, we've seen a DeFi and we've seen that it's a lot of use cases, a lot of application there in DeFi for, for our derivatives. And we started uh, to be present in DeFi at the same time. We have a lot of interest right now from the corporates. And yeah, but basically I can tell about all of this you just guide me what should I talk about otherwise I'm, I'm going to be maybe boring and talking a lot about the protocol and that type of things but in general it's it's really amazing how everything is developing around Andre that's cool and I think we do want to hear a lot about the protocol but um it, you know I, I'd also like to hear about kind of what led you to the protocol so what what was your thought process on you know I'm sure you were in a really you know safe job and, and it was really consistent in the legacy markets um, what drove you to make that transition and build this out in a decentralized way for the DeFi ecosystem? Yep, uh, that's that's a cool story. I was indeed in uh, probably one of the best jobs which I could imagine. I was uh, managing more than 20 billion uh, USD and all kind of fixed income funds. And that's a really cool job. Uh, you're managing kind of hedge fund. It's a really a smart job. So you have a lot of small, smart strategies, smart people around. It's, it's paid like very well. It's probably the, one of the best paid jobs in the market. And uh, everything was cool, but it was a little bit boring to see this huge and uh, not very efficient uh, financial sector. And, you, you know, you work every day with it and you see a lot of inefficiencies and you, you see a lot of things which can be done better. And it's, it's, it's huge at the same time. So it's a serious thing. And we started we, together with my uh, friend. We started to look at some fintech uh, innovation. We were looking for the companies and trying to uh, help them invest in them or be involved one way or another. And of course, we heard about Bitcoin. And at some point, my friend and now he's my co-founder, basically, he came to me and said, hey, this is the uh, white paper, or actually it was yellow paper of the Ethereum. We should invest there because this is really cool. This is like a future. And I was resisting for some time because I didn't understand it well. And then I uh, read more and more. And the more, the more I read, the more I liked it. So uh, we did investment in Ethereum. And since then, we stay with the protocol. We uh, develop uh, on top of it. We did a lot of experiments. And we also uh, stay within the community. And I think the community of uh, the Ethereum is uh, amazing. So it's, there are a lot of blockchains, but the community, which historically uh, are around Ethereum, is, is really cool one. And that all basically drove me from being, looking at it as a hobby into the real-time job now. Uh, three years ago, I resigned uh, from my normal job and we started Opium Team. So we started Opium Team, uh, as I said, without an idea that we, we we're going to be in DeFi. We just started to bring an innovation to the market, which I was part of for, for 10 years. And since then, I never regret that I quit my job. I have a lot of fun, a lot of intellectual challenge, and it, it's just amazing. Yeah, and, and building in such a a nascent space that is, you know, the decentralized finance world. It's something new every week, every day, every month. So it, it really keeps you on your toes. And I just read the blog post that you wrote about the CDS with Aave, which was absolutely amazing, just overall as a concept. Now, I'm wondering how, like, within the team, how do you guys prioritize which products and services you guys want to roll out? Like, is there a system um, that, you know, you and the team collaborate on? And then, like, how do you manage if you are in disagreement or you have a different idea of what you would like to do next with the team? Kind of how do you guys manage that? And how do you guys prioritize, you know, the rollout of your financial products and services within uh, Opium? I'm going to be very honest with you. Uh, it's an art, it's not a science. And I think that's also the strength. 
to say that it's changing every week, every month, every day. It's, it's true, it's changing every hour. The DeFi space is very hot at the moment. And waking up in the morning and you don't know what, what's going on and maybe there is something new, it keeps you sharp. But that, that's also a reason why big companies cannot compete at the moment. So uh, the, the whole space is full of startups. Even there is a billion of dollars, there, there are still startups because they are able to steer fast. Startup is like a speedboat. It's not a big Titanic that, that is huge, but it's uh, not very fast uh, to steer. But it's like, like a speedboat and you need to react fast. You need to react fast and you need to steer fast. You need to be sharp. So, and that's what we do. And you cannot make an algorithm. You cannot make the rule, okay, how we're going to build uh, the best products and most interesting products. It's just going, uh, speaking to people, uh, stay on top of what's going on. Right. Uh, you see a lot of opportunities and uh, you want to execute them fast. And uh, we are able to list derivatives like within one hour. Within two hours, we can build most of derivatives you can imagine. And that, that's kind of advantage we're using, we're trying. And if it does work, uh, it's really cool and we're happy. We have a lot of feedback. If it doesn't work for some reason, maybe people don't need it. Maybe it's too complex. Maybe we, we were wrong. I would just try a new one. And yeah, th thanks for the compliments about uh, the CDS for our I think that's a, that's a great example. They uh, introduce an uncollateralized lending, which potentially has a tail risk. So potentially you have a credit risk which of, of not pay, paying back. And we solve this with CDS. And uh, it's, it's actually funny that we have a lot of feedback. My uh, Telegram and Twitter was overloaded with feedback. And uh, some people were saying this is like creation of the new financial crisis. Because a lot of people, they uh, mess up uh, CDS with CDOs. And CDOs was a collateralized uh, debt obligation, something like this. Uh, that was the real uh, reason of the financial crisis in 2007, 2009. And CDS is basically another way around. CDS is a way to protect yourself from the crisis. And that, that, was, that was really amazing how uh, community react and uh, they realize it. And it's amazing, I've just started, it has a, a lot of future because people now starting to think about the risk as well. And they want to be hedged and they don't want to run big risk of losing everything. So that, that, that's a really good example. I like it a lot. And it's important, like you said, to stay flexible when the market is changing, both you know, from the listing perspective and the you mentioned the features. Uh, you can list very quickly, but then it's almost like an experiment. Some of them work out, some of them don't. Um, and then also on the customer side, you know, everything is so new that sometimes customers need to experiment with what's out there because they almost don't even know what they're looking for yet. Could you speak a little bit to Opium and how it stands right now, the products that you know you have listed, and then the roadmap um, you know that you see coming out and maybe future products. Uh, but of course, you know we'll keep in mind that Opium in particular is a speedboat, so have the biggest roadmap, but uh, you have to stay flexible. Is there anything kind of in the near future that you have your eyes set on? Oh yeah. So I, I don't want to spoil, I can tell uh, that we have a list of the products to try to introduce. And okay, let me make a spoiler. It's going to be something uh, connected to Elon Musk and uh, his activities. And uh, people lo love it and people would, li would, would like to have uh, derivative for this. I I'm going to stop now, but uh, we're build building something cool, something really cool. And we'll try it. It's easy to try, and I think it will be uh, really loved by the community. But the roadmap in, in general is several directions. So one direction is trying to build uh, cool products, uh, sexy products, and products which are needed at the right time, at the right place. So when, when we see CD uncollateralized lending, we think about CDS. Uh, when we see people speculate about the future token price, we introduce a pre-market. So you can trade the future for, for token which doesn't exist yet. So, and you can uh, already trade these expectations because people have different views. So we see also uh, a lot of uh, interest for the interest rate swaps. Basically, it, uh, interest rate swap is an instrument which easily allow you to fix your rate. So on, on a deposit or on the borrowing with most of the protocols, you are exposed to the floating rate, but you can fix it with uh, interest rate swaps and exchange it into the into the fixed one, and then you have certainty. So stuff like this is uh, one direction, but also imagine that all the centralized uh, liquidity can be aggregated, uh, not aggregated, but brought 
to the uh, DeFi, to the decentralized exchanges. So everything is traded on exchanges like Deribit, BitMEX, or even everything traded on Bloomberg can be traded in a decentralized way. And we are making the way, easy way for people to transfer this liquidity and get paid for it. And this is really cool because it's going to be immutable. So imagine I can install a humming bot which create orders in a DeFi and every time the order is picked up, I can hedge myself on a centralized exchange. I'm kind of a, not a hedge fund, not an arbitrageur, but kind of liquidity provider. And I can earn uh, 5%, 10%, I don't know, depends on the competition, but I can earn on it some interest just by bringing liquidity from centralized exchanges, even like Bloomberg, into the decentralized space. And in decentralized space, it's really cool because a lot of people, they cannot trade derivatives on centralized exchanges because of all kinds of restrictions, but it's also sometimes a very high barrier to enter into the market. And this is completely can be destroyed by the decentralization. Once this trick of transferring liquidity is done by more than me, if it's done by 100 people or by 1,000 people, then it's really immutable, it's really dem democratic, and it's really like robust. It's like a blockchain. So transfer of liquidity uh, between markets, between traditional finance and DeFi can be done in the same uh, philosophy, in the same logic, like the whole blockchain. And th this is really amazing. So that's another direction we work at. And we, we, we keep the, the third one, we keep our eyes open and we're looking for the real needs of the corporates, of the companies. And sometimes there, there's some stuff uh, we see there. An example is an olive oil future, one, one company, actually a uh, uh, set of the companies in Spain, they're building olive oil future on top of opium just because they need to hedge their trading risk. They trade a lot of oil, olive oil and they don't have instruments to hedge themselves. And if they go to traditional banking, they're going to be charged, I don't know how much, but close to a million and it's going to be a lot of legal fees just for starting. And they, they're going to write probably two, three hundred of pages of, of legal disclaimers and everything, but it's, it's not needed anymore. So now if you have iPhone, you can already trade all kinds of derivatives, you can make uh, deposits, you can use decentralized products of DeFi and so on so on so it's a little bit old school to pay one million dollar for, for just starting a pro yeah yeah for sure and one of the biggest kind of breaks that we've seen in the DeFi space over the past like just few weeks and months has been that news about Aave and their ability to soon be able to on-ramp actual fiat into the DeFi space but I've been wondering and this kind of ties into what you're saying about like the kind of mesh here with the CeFi and DeFi because if we're being honest, like having a completely unregulated, non-KYC permissionless protocol, that's just simply not going to fly with the regulators of our world in the financial sector due to risks, due to greed. There's so many things. And so like this idea of being able to use these protocols like Opium, like Aave, et cetera, et cetera, in this completely decentralized manner, you know, it's great currently, but I, I fear about the future, you know, whether or not the regulations could cause harm you know, whether or not they'll be completely shut down, if there'll be a lot of legal problems. So are you prepared for this? Or have you thought about this kind of like, what's your take on that? Like we could be experiencing, you know, where the SEC or the FINRA or the EU and all these global forces come and try to, you know, crack down on basically what's been going on in DeFi now. Are you prepared? Have you thought about this kind of what do you and the team feel is the ideal either solution or situation to this? Because I almost feel like it's not a matter of when, but a matter of if, you know, the regulations and whatnot start to come. Uh, I, th I, th I think it's a matter of when. <laughs> so uh, it's not necessarily bad. You know, we try to think of the regulation of uh, as of something bad. But actually, if you think why there, there is a cliche that regulation is bad and you will answer that because of currently the financial system is heavily overregulated. So what was happening last hundreds of years that it was a lot of holes in, in the financial system, a lot of possibilities to, let's say, hack it or to do some illegal or not ethical things. And for the every case, they were creating a rule. So that's how regulation works. So like the airplane, you know, every every crash of the plane uh, will create a lot of new regulations. And maybe in the airplane, in the air aircraft industry, it's good. Maybe I don't know. I have no 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 idea about that industry. But in the financial system, is definitely slowing you down, making you less efficient, and making you more bureaucratic. And uh, that, that's why we have a perception of regulation of as something not really good or even like very, very bad thing, I depend to, to whom you're going to speak to. But if you think of the regulation in a different way, like if you have open finance and we have only few regulation mechanisms uh, which allow 
all of us to benefit from it, it makes a lot of sense. And I think the regulation is needed in a DeFi, but not the regulation we see in the traditional finance. It should be starting with like regulation that, that does make sense, that uh, we're all benefiting from it. So, and that saves us from the tail risks and the systemic kind of faults. And this is absolutely, uh, in this case, it's absolutely a good thing because everybody will benefit. So if you, if you don't allow for the scam, if you don't allow stealing money from users one way or another, it's maybe not a bad thing, you know, it's a, it's a good idea. And I think it will come naturally because the community will realize it much more. And uh, a lot of people are already speaking about self-regulation or making a rating system or reputation. That, that's all kind of regulation. So when I have a rating system or uh, whatever reputation system, it's, it's already the start of the regulation because you make it more transparent for the end users and uh, they benefiting it and it's more fair. So the financial system or the regulator, the governments, I think they also understand it and they understand if they're going to ban it, as you said, there's a possibility maybe they, they want to ban it or they want to stop it and they want to fight against it. But they realize if they do this, then they're going to only postpone it or make it even worse. Even when it's not legal, it's going to exist anyway, but it's going to be like pretty bad. Another way, if they regulate and, and introduce a couple of regulations, which does make sense, everybody going to benefit also governments. And they, they already understood it. I think the point was uh, two, three years ago when they were trying to prohibit everything and Bitcoin is illegal or, uh, legal, and it was a lot of talks and a lot of attempts to make Bitcoin illegal. But nowadays, uh, I don't know, I live in the Netherlands, I think I, they, they treat my Bitcoin like my asset. And uh, there is very, very normal, very plain. I can do anything with what I can do with my assets as well. So I think regulation is good, but it should be like normal, reasonable regulation. Yeah. And, and I think it's a bit of a case of not necessarily there being a competition or, you know, a bad or a good, but more so a use case also for the traditional markets and the legacy users, right? So in a sense, what the regulation will do is it will make you know, say Opium, Aave, all these other protocols more able to support more money and more usage of their platforms yep. because of what they are generating, right? In terms of the yield, in terms of the opportunities, right? So it's like this idea of like, they're just going to slowly come to us almost. And I think that's kind of what you're getting at. Yep. Yeah. And we, we're going to go towards them also naturally because we will understand that uh, Wild West is not an option. So too many people die in Wild West and you want to have a agreement, uh, social agreement, and uh, from this social agreement, uh, everybody will be benefit big time. So we will go towards them as well. And Andre, kind of getting back to the protocol here, um, you know, we might see the regulation landscape change, like, like you're saying, from uh, more of like the accredited investor landscape into uh, something that might revolve more around smart contracts. So how does I guess this is kind of a two-part question. How does that impact the listings that you have on Opium? And then kind of how, how do you go about that listing process? Um, you mentioned, you know, olive oil futures. Is Opium kind of the place where everyone can list uh, their own particular derivative of choice? Or um, does Opium kind of decide which derivatives it's going to have on the market? Uh, very good question because we need to make it more clear. Opium is open, open source, open audited protocol, which uh, everybody can use. In order to use Opium, you just need to be able to program some lines of code in the Solidity, and you can access it with APIs. If you install uh, the Ethereum node, uh, you can build anything with it. This is Opium protocol, and uh, we build it like this. And we also build the Opium Exchange. And the Opium Exchange is a front end, which gives you the universal access to all the derivatives there. And it's like a Bloomberg if you compare it to the traditional financial system. For the Opium Protocol, uh, there, we cannot restrict anything because it do doesn't belong to us, but it's, it's kind of open, open, open source on the blockchain. But for the Opium Exchange, we want to limit, uh, not number, but quality of products that are listed there because we, we, are, we are in control of the front end. And we have very simple criteria, which called basic security check. So uh, si simply speaking, we don't want scam there. We don't want products which are not credible. If it does make sense, you can just fill in the form and we will invest in the relationship or we will invest our time and resources to help you to do it very fast. So, and, and we don't care if it's a future for a Ferrari or is it a future for a financial market. It should make sense and it shouldn't be a scam or at least basic security should be fast. Then you can have it there. Uh, that's really cool. And 
Uh, I've kind of been looking into how all of this DeFi stuff got started. And how does Opium differ from another protocol like Maker or like UMA, where it sounds like it's a similar process. You're kind of minting these derivative products and then offering them to the market. Kind of what what are the differentiators in Opium that uh, UMA, Maker, Synthetics, they don't really have, but Opium does. You want me to promote Opium now? <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> I, I can better just say, well, uh, we, we, don't, we don't know what is the best, so we have differently, uh, definitely we have different assumptions. UMA protocol, for example, which is probably the closest one. Synthetics is already a bit far away. What we believe in Opium, we believe that the blockchain layer is the settlement layer. We don't believe in uh, automatic market makers. We don't believe in on-chain order books. We don't believe in on-chain risk management. And we made Ethereum blockchain layer one, we made as a settlement layer. And it's like really primitive blocks are being settled on the blockchain. And everything else I mentioned, risk management, which is very important, by the way, uh, people tend to forget about it. Market making, order books, we put on a layer two. It's currently on the meta transactions, and it's, it's currently like a 0x type of relays, which take care of the meta transactions. But this is, philosophically, it's, it's, it's different, and I think it stands out in this sense from, from everything else. I, I don't know if it's right or wrong. Market can decide, and t- time will show. But that's also how the real financial system works. So basically, you have a lot of actors, you, a lot of stakeholders and a lot of participants who create together a financial market. And it can be automatic market makers. It can be the same, 100% the same market makers as Uniswap. It can be different market makers. It can be also uh, market makers who take a risk. And they, they, actually, those market makers, they normally make much more money. So also taking account the risk. For the risks they take, they, they, they make a lot of money. And so on, so on. Hedge funds, exchanges, it's, we believe it's a different layer. And this is a layer of the market, and the market is uh, not a blockchain. Blockchain is a settlement. And that's how we build it. That's how it works now. Uh, we have order books that can be as fast as centralized exchanges. Risk management is done on, on a layer two. So this is very important, what I mean by, by risk management. I, I'll try to explain short. The idea is that derivatives, they should be collateralized. If they uncollateralized, uh, you need to manage this risk. So if, if, you, if you know that, let's speak about insurance. This is a very simple example of duty. If you buy insurance, if it's fully collateralized, then you know that you can have, I don't know, 100 die as, as a coverage. But if it's not collateralized, so if it's only partially collateralized, uh, marginally collateralized, then you know we all cannot get this insurance at the same time. But it, probably if I, I need to be covered, I'm going to be covered. If you're going to be covered as well. But if 80% needs to have coverage, then there is not enough money and stuff like this. And this is very important to understand that the derivatives they created in, in order to hedge the risk, in order to make system uh, more stable. But if derivatives themselves need to be hedged, so because they, they, they introduce risk embedded in themselves, that's really, really dangerous situation. This risk management should be done not on the, on the blockchain level. At the moment, we see a lot of protocols where this risk management done in a blockchain level, and it's, it's done by, for example, margin call, liquidations, so on, so on. It works well, and it was working well at the beginning of the DeFi, but I think it's not the way to go. Because once I have unlimited possibilities to, to, to return money on the blockchain, once my return, my, my possible return is not limited, it means your possible risk is not limited. Because if I can make $1 million just investing 1,000 or 100, means somebody will lose this million, individually or together, but somebody will pay it to me. And this is a difficult situation because an unlimited upside is, is, of course, cool and everybody wants it, but unlimited risk nobody wants. And it was created in 2008 in the financial system with the CDOs, which I mentioned, and asset-backed securities. It was created probably, what it was, uh, like uh, 10 years uh, before, or even five years before, and this situation was created hundreds, maybe thousand times in the human history. And it's all the same. It's, it's all about greed and fear. And once the economical cycle is up, it's all about greed and people don't think about risks. But once it's, it's over, then people start to lose money and they only think about risks and uh, it's, it's too late. So uh, basically, you can read a lot about it from Warren Buffett. It's being said so much, but I think in, in current DeFi, people tend to forget about the risks and risk management. 
And then coming back to your question, uh, so we keep all this process on layer two. So on layer one, you always know your maximum gain, your maximum risk, your maximum return. It can be very high, it can be very low, it's up to you. You all always know the price you're paying and for what you're paying it, what is your upside, what is your downside. And that, that's one, one of the main things. We have some features in Opium Protocol like uh, portfolios, so you can wrap a, a lot of positions into one. We, we have spread trading, which is probably uh, half of the time uh, used uh, by traders. So spread trading is like when, when I sell something, I don't want to get cash. I want to have something else plus money. Let's say I want to exchange Tesla company stock into the Google stock and I'm willing to pay 20 cents on top of it. And I don't care where Tesla is trading, where Google is trading, but I want to make a spread. Or when I go uh, long Tesla and short equity market, that's very classical trade. Because I don't, I don't know where the equity market will go. I just sure that uh, Tesla will outperform the market. And in this case, I buy a Tesla future and I, I short equity market and I want to pay something for it, but I don't care where they both traded and if I'm able to execute uh, them step by step. I just say this is combined order and it should be executed all or nothing. So I buy this, I sell this, and that, that's the money I put on the table. All or nothing, please. And this is 50% of the trades in the financial system. So we also have it embedded in opium and so on and so on. But this is all the minor things. The most important thing is how we think about the levels and the risk management. Yeah, yeah. And it, it probably helps a, quite a bit uh, coming from the legacy markets and, and seeing where all that money is moving because you were doing it yourself. Um, and then implementing and integrating the same transactions in an open and decentralized way. So you, you certainly sound like you have a, a level up because you know, you've been around this ecosystem and um, kind of in, in the legacy markets and, and now uh, you understand where DeFi needs to go to integrate. One more question and then I think Andy, we can wrap it up. But for maybe some of our listeners that are less experienced with Solidity and, and kind of how they roll up their transactions. Could you explain meta transactions and then maybe just at the basic level, you know, how you can roll those transactions up from layer one, which is Ethereum, and then layer two to meta transactions, and then maybe, uh, you know, further layers from there? Yeah, sure. So, uh, by the way, we're uh, working now. We started on the ZK rollups because that's going to be the future, but it will take time. I just heard a couple of days ago that they have some really big move in the ZK rollups. I advise everybody to read about it. It's recursive ZK and it's kind of really big solution for the problem everybody is trying to solve. But answering your question, meta transaction is very simple. It's like the bank check. So you can issue the bank check, you can sign it, and I can give it to you. I say, okay, this is uh, $500 uh, for something, and I, I write a check for you. And you go with this check to the bank when you want, and you get the money out of the bank. It's kind of similar idea with the meta transactions. So uh, I want to drop a lot of orders into the order book, a lot of requests. And I, I, I know I can be opportunistic, I can, I, I can drop 100 of them, and I can withdraw 100 next second, but I expect maybe one or two being executed. That, that's how financial system works. So uh, traders trying to get the best price, they reprice their orders, they, they, they constantly look at it, and that, that, that's how normal, I don't need to explain that, how normal exchange works. And we do it with the meta transactions. Each and every order you're trying to get, you, you, you're putting in the order book, it's uh, like a bank check. And you're saying, I want to receive these products for this price. And here's my cryptographic signature for the order. And the real layer is taking care of your order. Uh, you can cancel it, you can withdraw it, and so on, so on. But once there is an opposite order from somebody else who say, I I'm willing to uh, do the opposite, and here is my cryptographic signature, then real layer taking those two orders and dropping them to the blockchain. And what the blockchain is going to do is going to say, okay, uh, I can validate the signatures, the cryptographic signatures. Okay, this is really Andre, okay, and this is really Bob. And Andre wants to get hundreds of something for hundred dollars and Bob wants to sell something uh, for hundred dollars. Okay, and then the blockchain does a swap from my account to Bob's account or another way around based on this. And small thing, before you do this, you need to give allowance to the smart contract to manage your funds and you can give allowance uh, to the full amount, full account or to the limited part of the account. But that's, that's basically like transferring money to the account of the exchange. First you go to exchange, then you need to transfer the money. Here you, you first go to exchange and you need, need to allow the exchange to do something with your thousand dollars and after that you just drop a lot of meta transactions on chain you can drop them every second you can reprice you can make you can build a bot who gonna uh, try to get the best execution of this the sweetest products for you for the good price and once one of the orders is hitting hitting the opposite one it's going to be settled it's going to go to the blockchain it's going to be settled and the exchange is going to 
happen in a blockchain, all the stuff needs to be done, going to be done. And this is pretty pretty good solution for the layer two. Before we see ZK rollups and very fast blockchain, Ethereum 2.0. It's really convenient to use Zurich protocol, use the same, and uh, a, lo a lot of uh, other projects. It also allows you to have a better user experience because they don't need to pay uh, transaction fees. It's, you, you just include it in the, in the price, so you, you just charge a fee and do everything for them. So it, it just ad advice to uh, read about it. It's, it's really cool technology used quite a lot. And even we can put order books on the fast blockchain. You need to understand that the fastest blockchain ever is still a million times slower than the Wall Street. And you still need a lot of speed. But these type of technologies can uh, solve this particular problem. And um, yeah, we really like it. Yeah, all the, uh, all the L2 scaling, that's all absolutely going to be our main focus as a community. I think, you know, to really get this actually going in a place where we can start to maintain and manage, you know, huge amounts of capital and to really spread the idea of this life and financial sector on the blockchain. That's like really interesting take and we'll definitely read more about the rollups articles. I know that we've done a bit of research, but certainly there's never enough in this new DeFi space. But Andre, it was an absolute pleasure. We are running out of time here now if there's anything else that you would like to tell the listeners about opium yep. or anything please uh sure i will just end it up with uh two ideas one idea is think about the risks because there is no free money you need to accept some risk and currently it's attractive but it's not risk-free so always think about risks and understand your risks and the second thing everybody is very uh, bullish on DeFi, and I, i'm i can be critical to DeFi a lot but I, I'm, I'm also bullish on DeFi. and just imagine that all DeFi together all like five or six billion right now it's still about one million times smaller than just the derivative market in traditional finance let's say you just need to realize that just the derivative market which is part of financial system is one million times bigger than the whole DeFi. so we're all bullish so we believe it's going to happen but it's, when it's going to happen uh, we need a lot of scalability you can imagine we cannot run certain activities anymore and even if it takes 0.1 percent of the financial system it's going to be like hundreds of thousands of time growth and we need a lot of scalability a lot of solutions and uh, that, that's probably the next big thing so yeah otherwise thank you so much it was pleasure thanks for the good questions interest and speak to you oh, yeah. next time i'm excited to uh hop on opium to start uh, looking at some olive oil derivatives and whatever <laughs> else we, we can list. Thanks for coming on, Andre. Thank you so much. Already is. Thanks for listening to the DeFi by Design podcast. Until next time, DeFi Slate Team. <laughs>